بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه All praises belongs to Allah سبحانه وتعالى We praise him, we seek his assistance and guidance and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and the adverse consequences of our deeds uh, We testify that whomsoever Allah Almighty guides then none can misguide and whomsoever he misguides then none can guide and we request praises and blessings upon our beloved master and teacher and leader Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I bear witness that there's no one worthy of worship besides one Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger uh, to my brothers and sisters in Islam um, everyone in attendance those here um, in the Zoom platform and those um, watching live um, on other channels I greet you with the greetings of peace the greetings of the people of paradise um, I greet you with the Islamic greeting, Salamu Allahi Alaikum wa Rahmatuhu wa Barakatuhu. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you all. I second what Sheikh Omar said. It's an honor um, for me to be here with you all uh, during this evening, while well, it is evening where I am. And um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a virtual gathering that uh, has come together. Uh, solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to make us a gathering that is uh, forgiven upon our departure and to make us a gathering that hears a good word and follows it. And this is um, an important dua, uh, especially in this day and age whereby information um, is everywhere and um, we listen to or we, we hear a lot. Um, but um, over time we see that subhanallah, Perhaps we were hearing and we weren't listening uh, because the fruits of what we heard perhaps um, didn't manifest itself in terms of our being. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a gathering that indeed hears a good word and follows it. We transform as a result of that which we heard. We heard amazing practical advice related to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connecting to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and subhanallah, how dear is the Quran to us and how um, in need are we to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially especially uh, after the year 2020 um, a year that uh, all of us will never ever forget with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will be uh, talking about it and its attributes um, in the years to come subhanallah unprecedency that is uh, the only word to describe this year. So this is especially a time when we need to connect to the Quran. And, um, you know, Sheikh Umar, Jazallah uh, Khair, he shared a personal, um, a personal message that this is what he did himself, you know, at a, a time when human nature uh, consumes the best of us, right? Uh, human nature consumes the best of us. We turn to the Quran and we uh, we allow the Quran to talk to us. And that's why um, the scholars before used to say that if you want to talk to Allah, make dua. And if you want Allah to talk to you, then read the Quran. Uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, um, the topic asked of me this evening um, is related to rights and uh, the rights of other believers upon us, the rights of other believers upon us and um, or the rights of others. Uh, upon us in general, the rights of others upon us. Um, and no doubt, if other people have rights upon us, then the Muslims have uh, rights upon us um, in a unique uh, capacity. Um, when we talk about rights, brothers and sisters in Islam, um, we, we have to speak about this topic um, holistically. And um, when we do so, we, uh, we have to expand our horizons and think about our reality um, in a communal setting. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us interdependent beings. We live uh, within societies. We uh, are our best when we are uh, living within society and interacting with society. And we know that Islam is not just a religion, but an entire way of life. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran, and uh, we learned from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and pondered over the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah and uh, engaged the intellect that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave us through deductive reasoning. We uh, understand that we live naturally within three laws, right? We live naturally within three laws. The law of I, 
the law of we and the law of they. This is this is this is physics, brothers and sisters in Islam. This is the reality. It's not anybody's fault. It's not anybody's choice. This is how life is by design. Us alive uh, in the sphere of this life, in the life of this world, means that we live within these three laws: the the law of I, the law of we, the law the law of they. Uh, the law of I is the simplest of them in terms of understanding, of course. Uh, but not simple in terms of application and implementation, because this is a law that teaches us that we will uh, be solely responsible for our deeds. We will die alone. We will be in our grave alone. We will be raised on the day of Qiyamah with our own aut autonomy. And we will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, alone. It will be us and our book, book of deeds. It's, it's a concept of me, myself and I. Um, when it comes to this law. This is a reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish us for the acts of other people, nor will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish other people for our actions. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in more than one place in his book, that no burden, no soul will carry the burden of another soul. We are alone in terms of what we do. If we act accordingly, we are rewarded handsomely accordingly. And if we choose to go the wrong way, then we will be victims of our decisions alone. Um, so this is the law of I. Then we have the law of uh, we. And this is um, uh, aligned to, the, you know, to, uh, to today's topic, the rights of others upon us. Because as I said earlier, we live in interdependent beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights this to us as well. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Zukhruf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ahum yaqsimuna, ahum yaqsimuna rahmat rabbik. Is it they? Is it, is it, yani, ahum yaqsimuna rahmat rabbik? Is it they who distribute the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone? No doubt, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He distributes his mercy. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives uh, some people more time so they live longer and he gives others less time and that's from his mercy so they don't live as long. Uh, to others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gives them a greater financial standing and material well-being. To others, he gives them a little bit less and all this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have different intellectual abilities. We have different characteristics, our character types and so on and so forth. All this is from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Uh, the countries that we live in, the opportunities that are available to us and so on and so forth. All of this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who distributes this mercy? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا That it is we who distributed their sustenance, their abilities, what they will receive in the life of this world. Okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ And we, re we raised some of them over others in rank. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? We have lam at ta'aleel which is coming. A lam which denotes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is telling us the reason for all of this. The reason for um, this distribution. It's not uh, a distribution um, without purpose. It's a distribution with purpose where people have more time and others have less, people have more financial standing and material well-being and others have less, people have a particular level of education and others have a different type of education and others have a particular uh, sets of opportunities and others don't. All of this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the reason for this is not so that we can become arrogant and we can claim rank over other people and so on and so forth. The reason for this as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضٌ سُخْرِيَّ So that they can take each other to each other as helpers, as assisters, that they leverage off each other's strengths, right? That they have rights upon themselves with regards to others. This is the rights of others upon us, right? That the, the, the you as a believer, there are Muslims who have rights upon you. There are non-Muslims who have rights upon you. And together you leverage, and you have rights upon them as well. And together you leverage off each other's strengths 
of each other's abilities and take care of the obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon you with regards to others and they take care of the obligations upon them with regards to you and this is how we have a transformative society we have a society that is blissful a society that is filled with mercy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best thing that you all can collectively gather. So this is the law of they brothers and sisters in Islam that naturally Allah has uh, distributed his mercies and these mercies entail obligations and uh, by us taking care of what Allah has placed on our shoulders with regards to others and they doing the same do we achieve a phenomenal society? Do we achieve um, what can be considered a utopian society, not a utopian society in our mind, but a utopian society in terms of what uh, uh, what living through divine values, what living a gender centric life entails. So this is the law of they. And as you can deduce from this brothers and sisters in Islam, um, this law entails us taking Islam to the non-Muslims because they have a right upon us to hear about Islam from us taking the reality of the sunnah of the of the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the character of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the reality of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to them this is a right that they have upon us our neighbors have rights upon us whether they're muslim whether they're non-muslim of course if they're muslim they have extra rights as we see in the hadith of ali radiallahu anhu and abu huraira in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the rights of a muslim upon another is six in another narration five uh, but as a common denominator, irrespective of whether you have a neighbor who's upon your faith or not upon your faith, they have rights over you, that you don't harm them, that you uh, take care of them, that you think of them, that you are in their service, you are proactive in terms of your relationship with them, that it's not a, uh, you know, they do, I do kind of relationship, rather it's a proactive one, one which is uh, based upon the sunnah whereby you make sure that you don't eat whilst your neighbor is hungry. Or if your neighbor is ill, then you are the first one there. He or she, they have the, that right upon us. This is the law of they. And the list goes on. And then lastly, we have the law of, uh, we said I, the law of um, we, sorry, the law of we. And then we have the law of they. The law of they, as we've said, uh, um, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, particularly I highlight in this particular section, the law of they meaning the non-Muslims, the rights that they have upon us, and I discussed this. Uh, I packaged it. I packaged it just now uh, with the second, with the second law. When we understand this, brothers and sisters in Islam, then um, we need to realize our placement in society, right? Uh, as the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, especially, because we all know, brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, if we are interdependent beings. We live within a law that constitutes I, we live within a law that constitutes we, we live within a law that constitutes a they, and there's no prophet to come after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the battle between evil and good continues to exist. We know that, um, uh, you know, shaitan's uh, enmity towards mankind will continue to exist, and we know that there's no prophet to come after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and if this is the case, then what will be the solution? We, we have to think about this. You know, what will be the solution to humanity? Who will be the solution to humanity? If I naturally live within these three laws, I cannot place myself, for example, on, on, on planet Mars. Uh, you know, they talk about Elon Musk and, and, and what he's willing to invest, right, towards creating com communities on Mars. Let's put all the wishful thinking uh, aside. Um, or, you know, some people call it praiseworthy thinking, but let's put all this, all these forms of thinking aside, brothers and sisters in Islam, living the reality, living the reality. If we have a role to play, the next question we have to ask is to what extent is our role? To what extent is our role? And given that there's no messenger to come and you and I believe in Allah and we believe in the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then immediately our presence in society today naturally falls under the spotlight. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you and I, the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are the best of all nations. We are the best of all nations. There's no nation greater than the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are the best of all nations. But again, brothers and sisters in Islam, you and I know we've lived long enough to understand that there's no role in life void of responsibility. There's no title in life 
void of responsibility. In fact, ceremonious titles are frowned upon. Nobody wants to be uh, given a title that they don't deserve, well, especially those, the people of honor, and they honor themselves. They don't want to be known for something that they are not, right? Even today with the whole honorary uh, postgraduate titling that they give honorary PhDs and so on and so forth. We know that even the non-Muslims, they have ethical guidance with regards to this, right? They actually tell you that you shouldn't use it in a way that you give an impression that you have an academic doctorate. This is unethical, right? You can use it, but in some quarters, you need to use it even with a little addendum, a few letters attached to it so people know that it is an honorary degree. You didn't earn it through an actual, uh, through actual academia, which is the process for uh, the default process. So there's a lot of um, ethical boundaries attached to the titles that we portray, the roles that we hold. And nobody wants to be known for something that they're not. So if we are the best of all nations, we need to ask ourselves, why? Why are we the best of all nations? We, if, if, if ceremonious titles is not something that is uh, praised unconditionally by mankind, then what about a title given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What about this title? What is the reality of this title? We have to ask that question. If we're holding it, then surely there's a responsibility upon our shoulders that mandates us having the title, which means we have to take care of that responsibility. We can't take care of the responsibility if we don't know the responsibility, right? Brothers and sisters in Islam. So what is this responsibility? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us this responsibility within the same verse, within the same verse in which he tells us that we are the best of all nations, right? Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best of all nations. Why? Ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah la ilaha illallah. You are the best because of three realities. Number one, you are callers towards good. Immediately understand that this is a right of others upon you, that you call them towards good. And you are advocates against evil, not selective evil, but everything that is evil, everything that the Sharia has told us is evil and everything that our intellect has guided us towards understanding that it's evil, right? So immediately it's the rights of other people upon us that we stand up in the face of oppression, in, this, in, 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 in the face of evil. No doubt how we stand up, that's a different topic. But the reality is there has to be some form of standing. Okay? And we'll talk about that just now. So that's number two. Number three, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when you look at this verse closely, you notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions these three realities that govern us, which bring about rights, uh, which other people hold over us in a unique way. What is this unique way? He mentions every verb in this verse using the present tense. And there's a secret here. Now we need to ponder. Why the present tense? Why not the past tense? The past tense carries a confirmed meaning. Why the present tense? Surely there's a wisdom here. And the wisdom is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us because the present tense in the Arabic language carries a meaning of now, and something that is continuous, right? So if we, if we understand this and we go back and translate the verse, we will say that you are the best of all nations because you continuously invite towards good and you continuously forbid evil and you continuously believe in Allah. Because you are defined by these three responsibilities, you are the best of all nations. It makes sense because which individuals carried these responsibilities by themselves? No other than the Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam. The Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam, they carried this re these responsibilities by themselves. And thus they were the best of all men. The best of all people of humankind are the Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam. Why? Because of these three roles. But after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's no man to come. There's no prophet to come. There's no messenger to come. But the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will now bear the, the, the weight of this legacy. The legacy of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa sallam. The legacy that began with Nuh alayhi salam and was carried diligently, prophet after prophet, messenger after messenger, up to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who now takes 
to uh, you know hold of that legacy it's you and i brothers and sisters in islam collectively the ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam here we see that you have rights upon me as a muslim and i have rights upon you as a muslim you have a right that i do my part with regards to this legacy and i have a right i i have a right upon you that you do your part with regards to this legacy and then the non muslims have a, uh, rights upon us that we do our part with regards to this legacy subhana rabbi al a'la inviting towards good forbidding evil and believing in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and given what we said earlier that this verse is in the present tense we understand that there's no break from this there's no weekend from this there's no public holiday from this there's no uh bank holiday from this right it, we are constantly defined by these realities just like we are defined as human beings there's no break from being a human being you don't log off from being a human being and then log back into being a human being right brothers and sisters in islam obviously i can't see you i can only see me um but i hope you i hope you with me and i hope you following me brothers and sisters in islam we have to understand that we are important we were a nation that were sent to give and not to take we were sent as solutions and not as problems we were sent as a mercy to humanity just like the prophets were uh, were, were were defined as uh, mercies towards society and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin that we never sent you except as a mercy to uh, to all of mankind to the to to mankind to jinn kind to to the to to the worlds right and everything that the worlds entail and everything in it and everything above it and everything below it and everything in between it the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent as a mercy you and i we continue that legacy of being a solution for humanity by remembering the three roles that govern us now somebody might say you know what sheikh this is too difficult you know invite always inviting towards good i don't have the capacity sometimes forbidding evil i don't have the capacity sometimes okay believing in allah my iman goes up my iman goes down i'm a human being i'm also under attack from shaitan i'm also a product of society i'm affected by society i'm affected by i i i don't want to be but i i, I can be right that's plausible that's normal so how do i manage carrying this legacy right and that's a very good question and remember that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a believer is one who when he or she sees wrong he or she stops it with his or her hand if not with his or her tongue if not with his with his or her heart same thing applies to good we implement good with our hand or with our tongue or with our heart and that's the weak that's the weakest state obviously is when you can't act and you can't speak but at least you can feel but brothers and sisters in islam today how much wrong do we see and our heart doesn't flicker how much right How many good acts do we see people leaving and our heart doesn't feel anything about it? Right? How many how much abuse do we see? Abuse of 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 roles, the muslim role, a person not be, being diligent with their salah, right? They're abusing their role with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we don't feel our you know in the least we should feel. Maybe we feel shy to speak to them because we haven't reached that level of iman. whereby we can put our shyness behind us and and do what the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam would have done but okay at least in your heart you're not feeling it in your heart right when you see a sister who's not dressing according to the sunnah at least in you, we're not saying judge anybody when there's no allah judges we don't judge but we call to the sunnah without judging she could be she could enter jannah light years before us but that doesn't mean we can't call her to the sunnah he could be entering jannah light years before us but that means that doesn't mean we can't call him to the sunnah there's a problem today where we conflate advising people teaching people calling them to that which is better we conflated with people being arrogant and you know don't judge me you know you don't know where my beard is brother my beard is in my heart you don't know my hijab i wear my hijab on my heart well I'll, I'll, look i don't have x-ray vision right <laughs> we don't have x-ray vision The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't have X-ray vision, right? So, Allah subhanahu wa taala knows what's in your heart, but Allah told us to invite towards good, to forbid evil, to believe in Allah based on the apparent, based on what we see, using the rules and regulations of da'wah, no doubt. 
looking after the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that we are the best because of this responsibility that we carry. We have to do our job. We have to do our bit with wisdom, no doubt. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom. And in a, in a good way, in a good way, with good as admonishment, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he this religion is a complete way of life. There's no contradiction in it, brothers and sisters in Islam. But the point being, brothers and sisters in Islam, when we talk about these rights, the rights of others upon us, what does it mean for us? It means that we need to step up and we need to do our part in, in, in helping carry the legacy of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we step out, that legacy will be carried, but it will only become heavier on the people who opt in and choose to carry it. And today, we know we see vice in society and parents are calling out and teachers are calling out. Where are the imams? Where are the scholars? Where are the du'at? There's so much vice. We're losing control of the youth. Yeah, well, you know, they're only human beings, right? And they've been left alone to carry this legacy. Where are you, my dear brother and sister, from being a model husband upon the sunnah, from being a model wife upon the sunnah, from being a model mother and father upon the sunnah, raising children who won't be a burden to the imam tomorrow. Where are you from that role? That is you playing your part in carrying the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where are you in helping your neighbor who's having a difficult time with their son and assisting him in raising his children? Because your neighbor has rights over you, which include this as well. And you being part of the team that is supposed to carry the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where are you from helping the carrying of this legacy so that it's not heavier on the imams and the du'at and your neighbor's case doesn't become a case, another case for the imam to look at. Right? Where are we, brothers and sisters in Islam, in taking care of the rights that the poor have on us? Right? So that the imam doesn't have to keep on asking because the imam sees less and less fewer cases as the years go on because we are playing our part in transformative giving, in using our zakah the right way, in giving sadaqah, in keeping our money in our hands and not in our hearts, but only Allah in our hearts because we're working on our iman. And this is a right that other people have upon us as well because part of the reason why we are the best of all nations, brothers and sisters in Islam, is because we are believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to work on our Iman and develop our Iman. Doing that is taking care of the rights that others have on us. And them doing it to themselves is they're taking care of the rights that we have upon them. And this way we create uh, the society that we, um, the, you know, in this way we become the change that we wish to see. That's what it's about, right? Now, Look, I'm, I don't, I'm not speaking about this from a vacuum. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to bring to you wishful, um, uh, you know, meaning um, I'm not going to bring to you um, hope in a wishful way. But I am going to bring to you something that we on an individual level can step up and act with. And that is us stepping up and claiming our place under the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and flexing our muscles and doing that which we need to be doing given that we are the best of all nations, right? If you see wrong, at least build your iman to a level where you feel that that is wrong and I need to raise my hands and make dua for my brother and sister. In the least brothers and sisters in Islam, you can't talk to them, you can't use your hand to stop them, but at least make dua for them. When you see a poor person, at least feel the hurt that keeps you up at night to raise your hands and say, Ya Allah, enrich that person, Ya Allah. And I thank you for what you've given me, Allah. This is the way of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is how the believers roll, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, in the colloquial youth term, right? We say, how, how do you roll? The believers, this is how they roll, right? They're always selfless. They are legacy orientated, right? They, have, they don't have dreams which they see in their sleep. They have dreams that keep them awake and stop them from sleeping, right? They, 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 they want to live a life that, that will teach people how to, how to die in their living and how to live in their dying. Like the Prophet ﷺ did for us and his companions and those who followed in their footsteps. This is who we are, right? This is who we are. We are servants of Allah, not servants of our desires, right? So 
these are the rights that others have upon us. And uh, it starts from within because charity begins at home. It starts with developing that Iman. And when you develop that Iman, which needs patience, by the way, and time, right? Because nothing happens at the flick of a button. That only happens in Jannah. In this world, if you want something special, you got to work for it. So you need to be patient in developing your Iman until it gets to a level when at least you can invite people towards good. And it gets to a level where you can forbid them from the wrong that they're doing, or at least warn them against it. At least be a sincere advisor to them. And accordingly, reclaim the place, the God-given place that Allah gave you as a member of the public that is supposed to be carriers of the greatest legacy the world has ever seen. Brothers and sisters in Islam, we will meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of Qiyamah. This is a reality, inshallah. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is how do we want that meeting to be? You guys are the most amazing people at, mashallah, getting the opportunity to, to, to hear this type of messaging, right? At this age, right? I, I didn't have this uh, in, in this capacity, right? The question is, how do you want that meeting to be? Do you want it to be a meeting in which he smiles? Or do you want to be a meeting in which he tears? Because the angels push you away from him. And when he tells them that he or she is from my ummah, the angels say, you don't know what they did after you. They're from your ummah, but they never lived to the responsibilities that being a member of your ummah entails. They never took care of the rights upon them with regards to other people because of them being a follower of you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa How do we want that meeting to be? And that's why brothers and sisters in Islam, we live at difficult times. My time has come to an end, inshallah. So I, I will end it here, but inshallah, the message is clear. There's so much we can say on this topic. I've tried to package, package it within this particular verse and present it in, in, in this particular capacity. But one last thing I'm going to say, brothers and sisters in Islam, when you understand your role like this, right? When you understand who you are, you're not some, you're not anybody, you somebody, you somebody, right? You are the person that needs to live the life that the people will miss after you pass away, right? And, and, and doing so requires you to become selfless. That's what it requires you, to be a servant of Allah. Put your desires behind and put Allah's right upon you first. And this topic in, in includes that as well, brothers and sisters in Islam, because the rights of others, meaning also the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has rights upon us and put the rights of other people uh, as well in front of you. Now, brothers and sisters in Islam, the last thing that I wanted to say, uh, uh, which I, I, I said uh, um, is the last thing that I will say is um, or what I wanted to say earlier. Please forgive me for, for, for <laughs> the screen changed here. So I was just checking if there was any messages for me, it distracted me a little bit. Uh, but the last thing I want to share with you guys, especially the university goers, brothers and sisters in Islam, my dear boys, my dear girls, my younger brothers, my dear sisters, know and understand well. Know and understand well and really well, brothers and sisters in Islam. Okay? We live in tough times. We live in tough times. Shaytan and his team have also infiltrated, quote unquote, what we call today the scholarly community. And you will find scholars, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, who will be callers to the hellfire. You will find scholars who will love to share with you minority views, views that the vast majority of the ummah from the first generation of Islam rejected to help you stop feeling guilty for your weakness for your wrong right you will find these scholars unfortunately right you need to move your interaction with the scholarly fraternity to the next level you have to right you and i would advise you all to stop asking is this allowed or isn't it allowed and start asking what would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have done? This is, this, is, this is the crux of it, brothers and sisters in Islam. At the end of the day, what's the gold standard? What is the gold standard? If we are people of excellence, believing in Allah and the final messenger, with the final testament being the best ever, the best testament, the best book, the Quran, the timeless miracle, that is our book. And paradise having been, create, you know, been created for us. 
nothing but the gold standard or, or higher, call it a platinum standard. I don't know. But you get my point. That is the only standard that matters. And the gold standard or the platinum standard is Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In the messenger is the perfect example for you. Stop asking, is music haram or makru? Waiting for that scholar to give you the fatwa that pleases your soul so that you can start listening to music without the guilt. Ask rather, what would the Prophet ﷺ do? Oh, scholar of Islam, tell me, did the Prophet ﷺ listen to music? This is the level we have to take our questioning to with the, with, with the scholarly fraternity. We need to uh, build ourselves to this level. And through this, we will help them. Through this, we will help them. Because unfortunately, and it's a sign of the times, right? You know, you, you end up becoming a victim of your community. Because sometimes you're in a community where everybody's iman is at a level where they're just doing the wrong thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, telling them the right thing sometimes makes things worse. We live in difficult times. So, you, you, you know, you're forced to always bring fringe views to try and manage the situation. But in the world of globalization, those fringe views get spread across continents and enter communities that have imams and teachers teaching them different things. And then shaitan comes to those communities and say, look, your local imam said it's haram, but that famous celebrity scholar on Facebook, for example, or on social media, he said it's only makru. Mm -hmm. mm. What does shaitan do? Plant a seed for you to go high in your standards or drop? What do you think? It's to drop you. It's to drop you. Even if it's makru, brothers and sisters in Islam, don't be mis misguided with the term makru. Makru means dislike, but if it's done as a system, it could be haram. In any case, brothers and sisters in Islam, a, a practical tip that I will leave you with is this. Right? Set the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as your gold standard. Stop asking about halal and haram in a day and age where sometimes, you know, um, the answers that feed into your desires are out there, right? One of the ways to protect yourself is by becoming more intelligent with the questions that you ask. Questions that you know won't give your desires a chance to overcome you. Stop asking, is it permissible or not? And start asking, what did the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do, right? And take it from there. Whether it's to do with music, whether it's to do with, with anything, uh, male gender interaction, irrespective of what it is, ask what would the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? And bin Allah Ta'ala, with the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, you will find uh, the necessary nourishment that our Iman needs and requires, and you will grow from strength to strength, and you will begin to transform with the knowledge that you know. And this is important. You know, it can't be that we're involved in so many things. We volunteer at this organization. We listen to this lecture when we you know, uh, on the way to work and on the train back, we listen to, to that lecture. And there's just so much random activity. And at the end of the day, we don't live the value proposition that those opportunities actually held, right? That those, that talk you listened to had such a value proposition, but we don't, where's the value from that talk that you listened to in terms of you? How have you changed because of that lecture? How have you changed because of that WhatsApp forward that was upon the sunnah that you read? Is it a case where you live life through just seeing instead of witnessing, just listening instead of hearing, just knowing instead of understanding, right? Is it a case where you proud because you're just a busy bee? Well, guess what? A rocking horse is also busy. A rocking horse is also busy, but it doesn't progress. A rocking horse is busy on the same spot. This is not who we are, brothers and sisters in Islam. We have to progress and transform from the things that we do. I pray I've left enough uh, food for thought for you all to ponder over. And um, everything correct said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And any mistakes are from myself and shaitan. And I seek Allah's uh, forgiveness. I am uh, available. Um, I, I have a website with details. If you wish to contact me with um, certain matters from this lecture that you feel requires uh, uh, you know, more explanation, inshallah, I'll try my best uh, uh, to respond to you. Um, everything correct said is from Allah. Any mistakes are from myself and Shaytan, and I seek Allah's forgiveness. And um, I pass over the microphone to 
our moderator. Uh, if there's any questions, um, I do see some questions on the screen. We can take them. I don't know if they're for me. Is Sammy, that... are they for me? Um, yes, Ustad. Um, so we have about four or five minutes to for some questions. And I just recommend once again, everyone uh, screenshots Sheikh Sajid's um, uh, details so that they can answer them if they don't get, they can ask their questions later if they don't get answered now. So we'll go on to questions, inshallah. Okay, so I'll just read what's in front of me and take them, take you through them. I'm struggling reading the English translation of the Quran. Do you have any tips? Yeah, I mean, I would tell you to find a translation that is suitable. Different translations are written with different objectives, right? Some are written to manifest um, a good flow of the English language while capturing the meanings. Some are meant to be technical translations with explanations, because as we know, uh, whilst the translation is a type of explanation of the Quran, but there's certain um, words in the Quran that uh, require extra explanation. So some um, translations of the Quran have them. So you find multiple brackets within uh, the sentences and this makes it sometimes uncomfortable reading for some people. So firstly, you have to choose um, uh, a translation that is suitable to your level, uh, to your language uh, level. Um, you struggling means a few things. So I'm not sure exactly what is it, is it, is it because of the, of the translation, but I will also say uh, some people struggle because of uh, burnout. Um, and if this is the case, then try and bring into your program uh, a study buddy, a buddy system, a type of peer-to-peer -peer learning process whereby you find someone else who's also interested in reading, reading the Quran and then you separate, you know, you, you sectionize the pages that should be read every day and, to, uh, you know, together you read it and you check up on each other that, you know, you, you, you're getting through it. And if you feel that it's too much, then, you know, don't, uh, and you're still burning out, then reduce the capacity. So if it's, if 12 pages is too much, reduce it to, 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 to half of that, to six. If that's too much, reduce it to three, but make sure that you, you know, you're doing something. The most beloved acts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those acts which are continuous even if they are a little. Uh, any advice for low self-esteem? Uh, Subhanallah. Um, obviously, to answer this question, one needs to know the cause for it. There's many causes that lead uh, to low self-esteem. Low self-esteem is a result. It could be of environment. Most likely it's because of environment, because of upbringing, um, and so on and so forth. But very quickly, I'll just say that uh, understand that... Um, he who has Allah is never alone. And if you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have everything because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything in creation. So um, start with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, the way to, to, to start with him subhanahu wa ta'ala is to look after his obligatory acts and to learn about Allah via his names and attributes. And, and personally, in some of my mentoring of, of, of some who are going through low self-esteem, uh, there's some names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that have been phenomenal in uh, developing their ability with themselves and bringing back the necessary confidence that they once had or even bringing back confidence that they didn't have. There's names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you understand them, subhanallah, you really understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and the reality of his presence in your life and it removes some of the cues and triggers that sometimes causes uh, low self-esteem. So start with Allah, look after the obligatory acts, learn about Allah via his names and attributes. Allah says, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Learn about Allah uh, with his names and attributes, knowing, st starting with the fact that you, you understand that there's no one worthy of worship besides him and build yourself up. Take a name, understand what it means and then think about the implications of that name in your life, right? And this is how you interact with the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, you heard from the Sheikh Omar, the importance of the Quran. Let the Quran be your companion. And don't forget dua. Dua is the weapon of a believer. Uh, the morning adhkar, the evening adhkar, they are phenomenal in removing the evil eye and any um, metaphysical um, hindrances that uh, might be afflicting us and we don't realize be regular with the adhkar. Don't ever miss the adhkar. And in the adhkar, as you develop yourself with them, you will see, subhanAllah, that there's some adhkar that have meanings that are phenomenal in terms of curing low self-esteem. Uh, the next question says, I'm confused about how to distance myself from friends who are involved in haram. They have rights upon us. Aren't we meant to bring them out of haram rather than distance ourselves? You are right. You are right. But one doesn't entail the other, right? It doesn't mean that... Um, you have uh, you have you have difference in principles that that stops you from uh, cooperating in, in in shared interest. Right, one doesn't necessitate the other. Um, distancing doesn't mean that you can't invite them to Allah. 
um, you know, um, distancing may entail that you, you interact with them a, a little less. And that's for the sake of your own protection because al maru ala dini khalilihi, a person is upon the way of his friend. If you always in that circle, then you are bringing your own self to harm. And remember we said we have the law of I that we live with. We will be answerable for, for our own deeds in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to take care of our iman first before we take care of the iman of other people. So if you develop yourself to a stage where you won't be affected by uh, being with them in some capacity and guiding them out of their difficulty, go ahead. Um, um, uh, you know, but uh, don't conflate the two. It doesn't mean that you stop hanging around with people who end up going to discos and nightclubs and uh, they end up listening to music or talking only about girls or girls talking about boys and everything is fahisha and very little remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their gathering. It doesn't mean you opting out from being a part of that gathering that this means that you're not their friends, that they, you know, you're not going to give them their rights, right? Uh, develop your iman to a level where you can be with them in some capacity and tell them that, that look, this is wrong. This backbiting that you're doing is wrong. Right? This weekends that we get together with and we don't mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or talk about this is wrong. Why don't we better our times and so on and so forth? Uh, if you can get yourself to that level, by all means. Right? So don't conflate the two. Distancing yourself doesn't mean that you stop inviting them towards good or forbidding evil. Doesn't mean that brothers and sisters in Islam. It just means that you involve yourself in environments that are better for your iman and your development. Right? And um, based on that, you engage them. Um, sometimes shaitan comes to us with this confusion, uh, with this shubha, with this misconception to stop us from taking the step. Right? Shaitan will say, ah, oh, so now you're becoming arrogant. Hmm? You think you're more holy, you're more pious. And just because you started praying, so now you're looking down on them. No, I, I, me praying and choosing to put my prayer before my friends doesn't mean I think I'm better than my friends. Allah could forgive them and put them into Jannah and hold me accountable for my few deeds. This is all possible, right? This is all possible. Right? They, Allah could guide them just before their death and they go for hajj and all their sins are forgiven and they pass away with clean slates. We don't judge. So don't allow shaitan to whisper differences and let's not conflate things, right? Sometimes distancing yourself is a necessary um, uh, a, necess a necessary um, uh, a product, right, of your journey, right? Because if you remain in, if you are, if you remain in mosquito-infested waters, then expect to be afflicted by by malaria. That's how it works, brothers and sisters in Islam, right? So it's a matter of physics. Um, tips for avoiding free mixing at university. I find this quite challenging. Wallahi, you are right. It can be challenging because obviously, you know, um, not everybody's thinking like you. So people will, will, will pass you and so on and so forth. But what I will say is, uh, you know, be upon the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of your ability, right? Make sure you don't get desensitized. This is what I was saying earlier. That subhanAllah, today we're so desensitized to life. We can't even invite towards good and forbid evil with our hearts. And in Arabic, they say, kathrat al-misas. Uh, uh, this is desensitization you, you, over and over again you sing billboards with naked pictures so khalas, all of, before it was you turned your head then after a year uh, you stopped turning your head but you felt in your heart it was bad after two years you felt ah, everyone's doing it you become desensitized you, you put yourself in an environment where everybody f uh, chats and free mixes etc without looking after your heart it's your job to look after your heart it's your job to look after your iman Right, you know, uh, if you have to be in that environment, take the antidote. Take the antidote. Do your morning adhkar. Make dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, asking Allah not to ever make you lose this the the, the sensitive nature of your modesty. Right, and interact with people uh, based on uh, circumstance and situation, and where you are in control. Maintain yourself, but don't let it be a time. Don't let allow yourself to uh, to enter a phase whereby khalas. You've, uh, you've just given up on the concept of uh, free mixing and you proactively uh, put yourself in uh, free mixed environments and discussions and khalas, it's become adi. You know, as they say, free for all kind of, uh, kind of a thing. No, uh, don't do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will reward you. Brothers and sisters in Islam, this is the dunya. It's tough. This is the dunya. We're not in Jannah. Huh? In Jannah, you wish for things and it happens as you want. In this world, it isn't. And if you're living in uh, a non-Muslim uh, society, then those sensitivities are there. And the good news is, you know, especially for those in the UK, and I believe most of you are, 
the UK prides itself on its diversity. So this is the chance for you to, to celebrate that diversity. Nobody's expecting you to become like the other, right? So you got to remove sometimes, you got to remove the inferiority complex that forces you to start thinking that, oh, they might be thinking of me like this and I need to change. You know, it's, uh, it's like the questions I received from parents during Halloween. And, you know, Sheikh and, you know, the other kids are doing it. So what if the other kids are doing it? You know, my, I don't want my kids to be left out. This is an opportunity for you, you to teach your kids that they're different. <laughs> this is the opportunity. It's not about converting them to be some, something that they're not. We shouldn't do that with our mindsets. We shouldn't do that with our, our nature. And we shouldn't do that with the religion, right? There shouldn't be an identi identity crisis at all these levels. So, Fattakullah Mastata'at. Work hard to protect your iman. Take the antidote. The morning and evening adhkar are powerful. The Quran is a guide. And as I said, if we take care of the previous advices with regards to how to interact with the Quran and interact with the translations and reflect over the Quran and learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will we find our honor? Walillahi al-izzatu, wali rasulihi, wali al-mu'mineen. Allah says, for Allah is honor and his rasul and the believers. Is that the last question? Yeah, Sami? Yes, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair for your time. We're so grateful. May Allah make us all people of Amal and may He reward you with Fardu Sulaala and everyone attending this and their families and this whole Ummah. Ameen. 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 Jazakallah khairan for having me. And um, um, I ran over time. I hope I didn't uh, bring any difficulty to your program. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us in person, inshallah, um, after we get uh, through this, this test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us in. We thank Allah for the internet. Something is better than nothing. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.